Have you ever wondered what a self-actualized human being looks like? How they behave, how they feel, what kind of goals they have in life, what kind of jokes they make? The term self-actualization has become more and more popular the last years, but the concept has been wildly simplified. What most people don't know is that there is a whole field of psychology that is dedicated to researching fully mature and developed human beings. In 1954, the psychologist Abraham Maslow first established the term self-actualization. And he dedicated his life to researching and interviewing thousands of people just to understand the most developed 1-2% to of humanity, which he considered to be self-actualized. He made a clear list of characteristics of self-actualization. He discovered that after self-actualization there seems to be an additional stage that we can develop into and he defined clear action steps to promote your own growth as a human being. This documentary right here is the most complete I've ever seen so far on this topic. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope it helps you to understand what we as humanity could become. So if you didn't notice already, I'm a big fan of Abraham Maslow. I read seven books on his theories. I always wrote massive summaries. This is just one summary from uh, one book. Um, and I think Abraham Maslow is one of the most underrated psychologists in history. And what I'm so fascinated about is something that Maslow himself said. It is as Sigmund Freud supplied us with a sick half of psychology and now we must fill it out with the healthy half. So psychologists know a lot about mental illness and what happens if things go wrong. But what if things go right? What's our potential? What could we as human beings grow into and how? Until Abraham Maslow came around, psychologists didn't know much about that and nobody asked about that. But this is exactly what this documentary right here is about. In the first chapter, I would like to share with you the personality traits and characteristics that Abraham Maslow noticed within self-actualizers. For example, humor. He noticed that there are two types of humors, more of a lower level humor and a higher level humor. The higher level humor seems to be more applied by self-actualizers. The lower level humor is more of a cruel and hostile humor. He came up with the example that he once saw a woman that got bitten by a dog and there was another guy laughing at that. That's more of a lower level humor. The lower level humor is also quite often at the expense of others. So if you're standing on a party and somebody's making a joke and laughing at others and putting others down, that is a lower level humor. And by nature, if you put others down, you make a joke, at others' expenses, you yourself appear to be better, more valuable, right? And Abraham Maslow also hypothesized that people do um, engage in this humor just to also prove their own value. The higher level humor is different. Here, people do have the ability to laugh at themselves. It's more an educational type of humor, and it's not at the expense of others. It's not hostile. And they are even indeed enjoying to make others great. They can even make a joke where they even lift other people up. They put them in a very positive light. And Abraham Maslow also said that this type of joke cannot be understood by everybody. Not everybody finds this super funny. And also he noticed that self-actualizers, they more often have this flooding, loving smile about jokes and not this, ha, 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 this belly laugh. Abraham Maslow also talked about the perception of reality. Self-actualizers seem to have a more correct and honest perception about life. So an example, you're at work and you're generally 
insecure. And one of your colleagues is though doing pretty well, he's doing a pretty good job. Now, you're insecure, that person is doing much better, that makes you even feel less valuable, you feel even more insecure. And that makes you feel jealousy, for example. So you start to not like this person as much because you, you kind of feel offended if somebody's doing much better because it kind of shows that maybe you're less valuable, at least in your perception. And that's why you start to hate this person. So you cannot look at your colleague anymore in an honest and truthful way. Your perception is skewed because you're projecting on your colleague something that is not truthful. And on the other hand, self-actualizers, they have a much more healthy self-esteem. So if somebody's doing much better than them, they don't feel threatened by that because they do know, hey, I'm valuable. And they are more inspired if somebody else is doing better. They even more try to learn from them. They don't have a hard time praising them, giving them compliments and feel actually happy for them. And as a result, they are capable to look at this person as they are, the good and the bad, they can judge it very objectively, very truthfully. Generally, self-actualizers are also more sensitive to superficial people and generally people who are not truthful at all. Another example, continued appreciation. Self-actualizers seem to continuously be able to appreciate the basics in life. They still, after all those years, enjoy the sunset, looking at flowers and looking at their partner, even after they're together for 10, 20, 30 years, they can still look into their eyes and see the beauty of it and still enjoy looking at their partner after all those years. So they're not just enjoying the triumph. They're not just enjoying if something special is happening, they're having amazing sex or they're getting a promotion or they're having an amazing work day, which is not happening all the time. No, they're also able to enjoy the mundane, the basics, the things that I've seen already thousands of times, they're still capable to feel love and truly appreciate another one. Problem centering. Abraham Maslow noticed that most of the self-actualizers, they do have a mission and a purpose they want to fulfill, which is beyond themselves. So they're not just trying to build a business for the sake of building a business or for the sake of becoming a millionaire. They do have a mission which contributes something. And again, they don't want to contribute so they feel like they're worthy. They want to contribute because they think it's important and the world needs it. And also, the type of work they do though seems to fit very much to their personality and their characteristics. So it really seems like they found their ideal medium. And Abraham Maslow also noticed that if he asked self-actualizers Let's imagine you could not follow this career anymore and you had to do something else. What would you do? And those people had a really hard time actually coming up with a solution. People who are not self-actualized, who are not following their passion, if you would ask them, hey, if you would do something, something else, they would immediately come up with something. Yeah, I would like to do this or that or, or rather something in this direction. But self-actualizers who really found their mission and are really in their ideal medium do have a very hard time answering this question because they don't know what else. They already found the, the career and the mission and the purpose in life that they actually really truthfully fit. And the list of characteristics of self-actualizers goes on and on and on. For example, they enjoy privacy much more. They're much more creative. They do have different type of values that seem to be very common among self-actualizers. They're much more accepting towards oneself and others. They're more spontaneous, more natural, have a higher need for autonomy, much more profound relationships and a higher Gemeinschaftsgefühl. So they feel much more connected to humanity. Now, being a self-actualizer does not mean that you don't have any problems anymore. You can still feel fearful, sad, you can feel bored, hurt. You can have all those type of emotions. That's still part of being a human. And nevertheless, you might ask yourself now, well, how do I become self-actualized? How do I do that? What needs to happen? What are the action steps? And to understand that, I would like to introduce to you the hierarchy of needs. And you might know it already, but bear with me, there will be new insights waiting in the next chapter for you.
According to Abraham Maslow, self-actualization is being achieved by climbing the so-called hierarchy of needs. So you start with the most fundamental need, which is the physiological need. You make sure you have enough food, water, sleep. And as soon as you manage that one, you are concerned with the next need that emerges. You want to feel safe. You want to have a stable income and a safe place to live. After that, you want to feel connected with others. You're looking for friends and a partner. And again, if those are fulfilled, you are focusing on feeling worthy and respected. And you want to build a strong self-esteem. And if the foundation is met, you are opening up to the level of self-actualization. You're keen on fulfilling your own potential which tangibly means that you do have a stronger understanding of who you really are and you're expressing that with your work and your general attitude. And on top of that, you're also building more of those characteristics which are typical for self-actualizers, which we already talked about in chapter one. This pyramid structure gives the impression that you suddenly unleash the next level. For example, you now have a family, friends and a partner, so you can just worry about the next level, self-esteem. But in fact, you can work on your needs simultaneously. Even when you're self-actualizing, you're still hungry. You still feel lonely once in a while, or you can still experience a blow to your self-esteem. But of course, these days you do have some needs that seem more important to you than others. And what's also true is that the more you satisfy your lower needs, the more you are concerned with your higher needs. Let me ask you the following question. What do you desire the most these days? Are you feeling lonely and you would like to work on your need for belonging? Are you keen on becoming successful and therefore self-esteem is something important to you? Lacking any need always translates into a desire and this desire shows you what needs to get done. It's like a compass. You just gotta make sure that this desire or this goal that you're having is matching with your deep need. If, for example, self-esteem is important to you and you really want to have a fancy car, does the fancy car really give you the healthy self-esteem? And maybe it does, but just double check that this goal fits to your deepest desire. Generally, your needs give you a very good hint of what's next so you can work towards self-actualization. Just as a tree needs sun, water and soil, so do all people need those lower needs from the environment. And as a result, you turn into a psychologically healthy human being. We need the foundation and even being dependent on others to receive the love, respect, safety. Those lower needs can be mainly satisfied with the help of others. At some point you grow out of it and you become a bit more independent of what others think and do, but that was only possible because the foundation is met. And we can draw a couple of more connections. Mental illness, for example can be explained with this model. Any mental illness got established due to a lack of your lower needs. For example, anxiety, maybe in your childhood or in the past, you did not feel safe. This need of safety did not get fulfilled. Or your parents were so afraid that they were actually super anxious and they were like those helicopter parents always make sure that you are safe. But as a result, nowadays, as soon as you go out of your comfort zone, you feel extremely unsafe because you haven't done anything on your own. You didn't learn about that. That's why you're anxious. It could be something in this direction. Depression, maybe it's a lack of belonging. Maybe you feel lonely. Maybe you simply don't have any communication or interpersonal communication skills with others. And that's why you feel lonely or you struggle to build deep connections or you have a very low self-esteem which makes you feel very unsure generally about life choosing a career you never feel like this is something that fits to me you're always unsure whether that's you or not and you like dabble around life in a very insecure way which makes you feel depressed but again all mental illness can be understood roughly in in, the, in that manner by just understanding the lower needs and what is missing here also, people who are still preoccupied with fulfilling the lower needs are more extrinsically motivated because again, those lower needs can be mainly fulfilled um, with the help of others, approval by others, right? good feedback, um, or you have good grades in school. Um, generally, people approve you or you find a mate, you find friends, um, you, you find an environment which is rather safe 
that's all very much extrinsically motivated. But if you're self-actualizing, you're more intrinsically motivated. That means that you enjoy the process. You don't do it so you get some external and extrinsic reward. You just enjoy doing it. That's why you're also much more creative because you can really dive into the process. You love, you love the process and, and, and that's why you can connect the dots much better. Um, also, you're generally doing something that you love much more because you understand who you are and you're not afraid of expressing who you are and do the work that you truly love. And that's why you also enjoy the process more. That's why you're more creative again, because intrinsic motivation is connected to creativity. Um, also, people who are more preoccupied with fulfilling the lower needs are more competitive. You know, they like to be relatively better than others, prove their worth. Um, and maybe destroying others and being better than others in general. And self-actualized people are so secure that they're not interested in, in, in doing that. They're not interested in competition. They're interested in cooperation, getting inspired, helping each other, because they know they can create win-win situations. So you can probably already tell we're drawing some connections with the first chapter, characteristics of self-actualized people, simply because this model to a degree explains why people behave the way they do and why they think and feel the way they do, especially self-actualizers, why they are the way they are. And there's a very good reason for that. Though Maslow also said that there's much more to becoming self-actualized than just fulfilling your lower needs. If you're at some point having then a very healthy self-esteem, that's not just suddenly giving you a meaning and purpose in life and you feel self-actualized and all those characteristics and your perception of life also changed. There's much more to it and the foundation and those needs are very important and necessary to meet them and fulfill them. But on top of that, there are more action steps that you need to undertake to get closer towards self-actualization. Though right now in the next chapter, I want to talk about a stage that can be actually found above self-actualization. So there is actually an additional stage. Nobody knows about that. Abraham Maslow wrote an article about this at some point, but nobody really knows about it. And I want to talk about this one first, and then we come back and we talk about more action steps. Abraham Maslow discovered that after self-actualization, you could evolve into the stage of self-transcendence. And people who experienced that described it as pure happiness. Every doubt, fear, tension was left behind. It felt like the ultimate truth, as if you have seen the secret of life. And people also said that it is as if somebody removed the curtain. They described it as a form of awakening, the end of all effort and striving, like you arrived. And it feels like everything is connected. There's not much of a difference between you and others. That sounds like a very spiritual experience to me. And what I found very fascinating is that what people described when they talked about self-transcendence, this is exactly what Buddhists call enlightenment. All the description, everything that I shared right now, this is exactly what people describe when they talk about enlightenment in Buddhism. And now it becomes even more interesting. It seems like the Eastern world and the Western world are talking about exactly the same final developmental stage, but they're totally different approaches to it, right? So the Buddhists, they more talk about letting go of desires, just sit there, meditate and just work towards enlightenment by letting go. And Abraham Maslow talks about this pyramid of need where it's about fulfilling desires and needs. And this is how you grow by making the experiences in real life and you can work on it. But both independent of the different approaches talk about the same stage that you will ultimately develop into. Now Maslow also said that he found out that people who reported those experiences about self-transcendence, they're not constantly at the stage usually, that's like at least the people he talked to, but they had those moments, those sneak peeks where they understood and felt exactly that way. And he called those moments peak experiences. And he also said that the more developed you are, it's more likely that you have those peak experiences. But Abraham Maslow also said that you can engage in certain activities that make it more likely 
that you foster and have such a peak experience. For example, reclusive contemplation, body practices like yoga, exotic travel, classical music, bird watching, love making, performing perfectly, such as playing the drums or being a speaker. And he also talked about specific moments. For example, he interviewed once a woman that reported a peak experience while she was preparing breakfast for the kids and her husband was playing with the kids while she was doing all that and suddenly she felt this peak experience. But Maslow also said that you cannot decide on when you're going to have such a peak experience. You more get surprised by joy. You get surprised by this peak experience. It's like chasing happiness. You know, happiness is more of a side product. The more you chase it, the less likely it becomes. It's the same with peak experiences. And nevertheless, Maslow also said that psychedelics, so for example, LSD and psilocybin, those are substances with which it seems to be able to more consciously and deliberately evoke a peak experience. But he, he himself, he didn't do a lot of research into that. He just noted this as a side note which I think also here is quite interesting to add. Now, finally, I would like to mention that it's very important to not just focus on the spiritual practice and just meditate without actually meeting the foundation, you know, self-esteem, belonging, safety, the physiological needs. If you don't do that first, it's gonna be quite counterproductive to just try to develop up here and develop towards the self-transcendence. It's like building a house, you don't start with the roof the higher the degree of psychological health, the greater the frequency of peak experiences, the uh, more intense they are, and the more illuminated, that is, the more cognitive they are, the more you learn from them. Another key point to foster self-actualization is the environment that you're living in. So in other words, the society you're living in. There need to be good conditions for you so you can optimally grow. So let's talk about a couple of aspects that the society as a whole could do to foster self-actualization within individualizations. That's not an exhaustive list, it's just a couple of examples. And um, let's start actually at the bottom of the pyramid, physiological needs and safety needs. What the society here, the government could do is to ensure, for example, financial equality. Make sure that there's minimum wage, that there's unemployment benefits. Make sure that generally the gap between rich and poor is not getting too wide. So pretty much everybody has the chance to feel safe, to have enough food, water, um, to have an apartment, to not worry too much about the financial foundation. Another aspect is also that generally rules and regulations are met, that people really feel safe, uh, the police works, there's few corruption, so you don't really need to be suspicious of anything and you really feel like I'm living in a safe society and I can only not only I can not only walk around feeling safe, but also I feel financially, generally safe. I do have an apartment, I do have food, water and a shelter. I, uh, the foundation is generally met. Also, if you didn't go up the, the hierarchy of needs, we could also talk about belonging. I just watched a TED talk where they talked about planning city structures. And nowadays in first world countries, for example, what happens a lot is that people travel a lot with cars very isolated and then they go in their apartments where they maybe live alone or only with, with their one partner and they talked about how could we restructure the city that it's more walk walkable so there are more shops and you can actually just buy food like just go out and walk and get everything you need all the groceries all the basics you need to buy make sure that there's more public transportation Make sure that there are more public places generally where you like hanging around in the evening and connecting with people. So everything becomes a bit more local. There's more bonding. You more connect with the people while living the day-to-day -day life. There's no additional effort, additional effort you need to take. It's just, I'm just living my life and I feel though more connected. I'm less isolated. And the way you structure a city is a big thing. This TED talk that I watched is uh, from the US, so there anyway, you know, the big highways, everybody has a car, everybody is very isolated while traveling. 
but also in a lot of other cities that play, plays a huge role. How can you make sure that people have a stronger feeling of belonging and connectedness while living in those big cities? It's a big point. Um, then another point would be if you go higher in the hierarchy of needs, self-esteem. And Abraham Maslow actually even wrote an entire book about business and management because he noticed, well, we work all day long, at least from Monday to Friday. And we spend most of our time that we're awake working. Why not also take a closer look what happens at work and how you can there help people to self-actualize. And one big point there, for example, is self-esteem. So how do you manage people at work? How do you manage employees? And an optimal way to foster self-esteem is to give employees more freedom and also give them more responsibility. So they can, in a sense, decide when they want to work. They also can decide how they get particular goals done. Yes, maybe they need to meet a couple of goals, but how they do this, they can decide on that. The teams become smaller, maybe like six or seven people. They have a particular room. They can even decorate that room the way they want. They make decisions more often on a team level. So the leader is not just, it's not a steep hierarchy and the leader always decides what to do. No, there's often also conversations and you as a normal employee who is not in a leadership role still takes a lot of responsibility and has freedom. That fosters a sense of competence. I feel competent. I feel like I can manage something. I feel like I have influence. Studies have also shown, I wrote down a couple of points here, is that actually employees get more motivated if you manage them this way. Uh, the turnover is raised, so sales and productivity increases and the customer complaints also decrease. Right? So they also feel that when things are going different and, and the employees are more motivated and, and do a better job. And, and Maslow though also said this type of management in organizations only works under good conditions. So if there's a massive financial crisis, everybody's struggling, managing people that way not necessarily, le necessarily leads to better outcomes. Maybe it's even getting worse. But if people are under good conditions, right? Everybody is already financially rather well off. The people are not extremely suspicious. It's already a rather healthy society. Then you can also apply this healthy style of management. And if the society generally is not already on a certain level of maturity, then you also need to deal with them differently. It's like with a little kid. If you talk with a little kid that's like two, three years old. If you just give them freedom, say, hey, you can decide how to do this. And they feel overwhelmed. They struggle with that. They maybe just don't do anything, right? So you also need to adjust a little bit your management style according to where the society already is. That's what Maslow also said. Yeah, and then there are much more examples you can go into. For example, the schooling system. Already in high school, already in primary school, elementary school, you can foster more self-organized learning, more learning in a way where people discover and the students discover more, they, they discuss more, they set learning goals and figure it out. They have more freedom in what they do and the teacher is not just always telling them how, how life works. Also in school, you could already start educating people on social pressure and educate them on, on social dynamics so people don't fall for that so much. Because if you constantly fall for social pressure, you don't ask yourself what you, don't, what you want. You don't live up your own desires and needs. In high school, you could already teach people how to meditate. You can give them emotional regulation classes, generally basic practical psychology classes so they understand themselves better and their emotions and their thoughts and can deal with that in a much more healthy way. You could also teach people in high school how advertisement works so people don't fall for the amazing marketing people do but actually they're selling you stuff that you don't actually want and need. Right? And that's also blurs your vision of who you are and what you want because you're just falling for random marketing. So all tangible action steps, you can help people to build and foster those basic needs better and to also ensure that there is a foundation for self-actualization. Yeah, again, not an exhaustive list, just a couple of ideas what society also could do and what you could maybe even contribute to society to change and help people to become more healthy and mature human beings.
Now, next to fulfilling your basic needs, so the physiological, safety, belonging and esteem need, next to engaging in those, there are also a couple of other action steps that you can undertake today to walk and get closer towards self-actualization. I want to give you three examples. And the first one is actually work. Maybe it's uh, learning a piece of on, on, on your piano, maybe it's shooting a documentary, becoming an engineer and go to university and study hard and engaging in that and could be anything. Abraham Maslow stretched the idea that work is important and also going through a period of demanding preparation and working something out intensively is very important to get to know yourself, to get to know your possibilities, um, understand who you really are. This is a very important factor. And he didn't say that you should be a workaholic. He didn't say that at all. He stretched also the importance of relaxation and letting go um, and though having a healthy balance. A second example is taking the growth choice. Abraham Maslow talked about the idea of not always taking the secure choice and just being fearful and take a step backwards, but actually get out of your comfort zone frequently, try something new, take responsibility and be honest if you did something wrong. Uh, throughout the day, there are always dozens of, of ways where you can say, okay, I don't feel like it, but let's do it that way because I know it's the right thing to do. He fostered that idea. And again, that doesn't mean that you always get out of your comfort zone and just work, work, work and, and, and be uncomfortable. No, sometimes it's right to retreat and relax. But the tendency, he talked about the tendency, the tendency of going out of your comfort zone, that that is a wise choice for you to grow as a human being. And lastly, listen to yourself, not always your parents or authority. Be prepared for also say something that is unpopular, but it's authentic. Also, make sure that you sometimes have a quiet time for yourself. Maybe you meditate, you just contemplate, you spend time on your own because the voice that you have deep within you, that's rarely shouting, it's usually whispering. And if you're always listening to others and what other people are saying, you're not even aware of what you want. So you also need to take your time on your own to contemplate, to understand what you want, to journal, to meditate, whatever it is, but also taking a step back once in a while and being okay with being alone for a little bit, even if it's just an hour. That's what he said, it's very important to, to listen to yourself. Uh, learn what's valuable for you, what's not. And that, that's on a very deep level, like what do I want to do with my life? But also on a, on a level such as, what kind of shoes do I like? Do I like the white shoes? Do I more prefer the brown shoes? Uh, what kind of food do I like? Do I like an eggplant? Do I like that food? Those are already basic questions you can ask and train yourself and understand who am I? What do I like? What do I not like? Also be in that dreamy state and think about, hey, how would I like my life to be? All those questions and all the things that I just listed here are about listening to yourself and understanding yourself. And those are very important action steps that you can take, very important questions you can ask yourself throughout the day. Now, lastly, I want to read out a quote by Abraham Maslow that I found very powerful to wrap up this documentary. It's not a state of being, but a process. It's a direction, not a destination. This process won't always bring feelings of happiness, contentment and bliss, and it may even sometimes cause pain and heartache. It's not for the faint-hearted. It requires continually stretching outside of your comfort zone. It takes a lot of courage to be the best version of yourself. All right, this documentary is coming to an end. I could have easily stretched this documentary out to two hours. A lot of topics we haven't even talked about, such as love, creativity, the values of self-actualizers, and generally a lot of information within the chapters that I was just cutting out. It was just getting too much and I wanted it to be at least a little bit dense. But if you have more questions, just leave a comment below. If you noticed 
there's a particular stage, for example, in the hierarchy of needs that I need to work on, that there is still something, or you need to make a decision, or you want to improve your communication skills, something tangible, where you notice this is something psychologically I want to work on. If that's the case, then I suggest that we're talking. There's a link below the video, you can just sign up for a call with me, we get to know each other, understand whether this might be a good fit, um, even work out a custom strategy and understand really how what working together would look like, um, and then we can make a decision together. Um, yeah, but otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the documentary. Um, you know the classics, you know, give a thumb up, uh, leave a comment below, uh, share the video, this is all what helps to spread this message um, and the work of Abraham Maslow. Yeah. And with that being said, I hope you have a beautiful day. Economy.